Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's great to join you virtually. Um, my name is Stephen Jarvis. Uh, I'm recent. This so this work I'm going to present to you was uh, work I, I conducted as part of my PhD, which was at UC Berkeley, um, where I was also a researcher at the Energy Institute there. Um, and I've just very recently moved to Germany, where I am now, um, and I'm based at the University of Mannheim. And and this is sort of my job market paperwork, um, essentially looking at the economic costs of NIMBYism and sort of the planning process more generally and, and using renewable energy projects as a way to get at that question. Um, I think I've got an hour, so I'm just gonna get through it. Um, feel free to interrupt if you have questions. At some point, I will have to speed to the end. Um, but yeah, feel free to interrupt with questions and I'll hang around for a bit afterwards as well for some discussion. Okay, so just to get people in the frame of mind of what we're talking about here, this is a letter that I happen to come across that is sent from someone uh, to their local councillor, I think down in Dorset, and they're very angry about the proposed uh, um, a proposed wind turbine or set of wind turbines in their local area. And so it sort of encapsulates all the kind of things that I'm hoping to get at with this paper. So first, they're kind of very distressed to learn that in a so-called civilized time, they're potentially thinking of giving permission for these wind turbines to be put in the, in the nearby area. As far as they're concerned, you know, it's obvious even to a philistine that you can't put these things here. The visual impact, the impact on the countryside is just unacceptable. But interestingly, they also kind of get that there is a real justification for these things. It's just a matter of where you're gonna put them. And that you know, no one's going to be happy having these nearby. They're kind of tall, they're, they're noisy, but surely there's some more remote, acceptable places you could put them. And then finally, they kind of conclude with another part of this. This is primarily a local decision, but they sort of raise the idea of maybe you're being bullied by the central government. Um, and you know, we wouldn't be too happy about that either. So it gives you a sense of the kind of dynamics that are going on here with these decisions. And really interesting and, and some of the things that I'm going to try and get at with this piece of work. But invariably, what these these kind of uh, examples of local opposition have led to is some pretty inflammatory news articles claiming that kind of NIMBYs and local opposition is a real barrier to um, big projects, particularly in the kind of green energy space. And so I'm going to try and look at is this true? Is this a big problem? So more generally, this kind of not in my backyard phenomenon and its impact on local planning processes has been seen widely as a problem, perhaps more so in things like housing or public transit. Um, but the actual kind of quantitative evidence is pretty limited. Um, it's just quite hard to study these things. Um, but what I'm going to do is try and get at this by using renewable energy deployment as a potential area to focus on. And here I'm going to look at the UK. And the motivation for this is to tackle big problems, big problems like climate change, we're gonna to have to build a lot of infrastructure in the coming decades, wind and solar projects being a big part of that. Um, but there's pretty widespread evidence of a lot of local opposition to these projects as I showed you with that earlier letter. And so potentially dealing with those problems is gonna be a barrier to getting this sort of stuff done. Um, and what the UK gives you is a really fa fascinating database of all the projects that were proposed, the planning applications. So you can see the ones that su succeeded, but you can also see the ones that, that failed. So you can sort of see this path not, take, not taken, which is really valuable if we're gonna try and get at this question of NIMBYism in the planning process. So what I'm gonna try and do in this paper is sort of answer two key questions. The first is just what are the local effects of building one of these things? Um, are they large? Are they small? And this is primarily going to be an empirical exercise using a sort of hedonics approach, looking at changes in nearby property values. What I'm then going to do is take that information through into a second part of the analysis where I then look at how does the planning process and how do planning officials weight these kind of local factors versus the other reasons we're doing these projects in the first place, sort of abating emissions, securing energy supplies, that kind of thing. How do they trade off these two different things? And a big part that I'm going to try and get at here is that there's some real split incentives between what, what makes sense for these local counties that are often deciding this and the broader kind of societal, national, or even global reasons like climate change that we're pursuing projects like renewable energy. So those are the two pieces that I'm going to try and get to. Um, and I'll sort of deal with them in turn. Um, but first, a quick sort of preview of the results. 
So for the first one, I find consistent with some prior literature that wind projects, they do have significant negative impacts on the local area, primarily in the form of some kind of visual disamenity, um, less so the noise, much more the visual disamenity. And this, this is primarily coming through in residential property values, it's sort of larger when properties are closer, when the project is more visible, and also it's concentrated in properties that, have, that are in sort of less deprived, wealthier areas. I do have a go at looking at impacts on commercial uses, but the data isn't great here. So that's something I'm hoping to build on in the future. And then for solar projects, I don't find any clear effects. It seems that wind projects do have these effects, solar projects less so. What I'm then gonna do in the second part where I'm then gonna look at how that affects the planning process is I do perhaps unsurprisingly find that local politicians, local camp planning officials are pretty sensitive to local factors. Um, and you do see that changes in those local factors have a bigger impact on approval probability than some of the other reasons we're doing these projects. This is more pronounced in kind of conservative areas that have been traditionally opposed to these projects um, and also more pronounced when it is in fact a local decision maker that's in charge. The last little piece that I'm gonna tie on here is pulling this through into a broader analysis of what are the actual economic costs this might impose? Is this a big problem or a small problem? And in this area, I'm primarily thinking of it as a sort of spatial mis misallocation problem um, where a particular focus on these local factors and the sort of local nature of the planning approval process could lead to a sort of misallocation in investment, a bias towards maybe projects that are located in more remote areas, even if those projects are sort of more costly and less beneficial for society as a whole. And what I find is it does seem that there is potential for some real misallocation to be going on for these wind projects consistent with them having this sort of distorting impact on the planning process. And so that's where I'm gonna sort of conclude to think more generally about what sort of policy solutions might be able to solve this. Okay, just to give you a sense of the sort of literature I'm trying to contribute to here on the first piece on what are these local impacts there's kind of a broad and growing lit hedonics literature that uses changes in things like property values as a way to value various environmental amenities that aren't normally priced. Um, and this includes now a sort of growing number of papers looking at wind projects and uh, one or two looking at solar projects. So the main value added here is just going to be this is we're going to be the largest study thus, thus far in terms of the number of projects studied the time period studied sort of multiple decades and the sort of number of properties being brought into the analysis. So it's really gonna facilitate a kind of event study approach that I'm gonna to use to, that should hopefully build some credibility and show you these effects materializing over time. And then there's gonna be some other sort of additions that I'll make using things like these proposed but unsuccessful projects as a way of sort of seeing what happens in areas where these things don't go ahead. And then also I'm gonna have this extra sort of piece of differential effects showing that these impacts are concentrated in kind of wealthier, less deprived areas, which I think makes a lot of sense is which kind of properties are going to have the sort of amenities that are going to be disrupted by one of these. They're going to be properties with nice views, with lots of green space, things like that. And those are going to tend to be wealthier properties in less deprived areas. And that's in fact what I find. So that's going to be a nice addition to the prior literature. On this second part is a bit more of a sort of disparate literature that I'm, that I'm speaking to here, a general sort of political economy literature, um, at least um, within this kind of area of local acceptance of, and renewable energy. There's quite a, a wide sort of survey based literature, primarily sociological, that's just sort of looking at individual people's attitudes and, and sort of what factors can help build local acceptance. So I think what I'm going to add here is a more sort of take a step back, let's look at revealed preference, kind of what, do, what planning decisions actually happen? What do people actually do in terms of the property they buy or the projects they approve rather than just asking them with a sort of individual level survey? So this is gonna be a nice complement to that. And then more broadly, there's a sort of wider um, political economy literature looking at things like place-based policies, local planning restrictions, primarily in the area of housing. And so I'm gonna to hope to add to that um, by looking at this issue of sort of misallocated investment and planning restrictions in the sort of context of larger infrastructure projects, infrastructure projects, in this case, 
um, for renewable energy. Okay, so that's some intro. This is the general outline of the talk. Uh, I'll give you a bit of background, a bit of context, um, uh, just on the sort of the planning system and, and on the kind of UK renewable rollout more generally. And then I'm gonna deal with each of these questions in turn and then end with some conclusions. And then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for you to um, ask me plenty of questions and have a nice discussion at the end. Okay, so a bit of background. These pictures are for the US audience, but I'm sure um, the UK audience will be pretty familiar with these projects. So this is a, a wind project up in Scotland. Um, and a solar project down in the south of England. And the, primarily here, I'm gonna be talking about large scale projects. So these are bigger than one megawatt, large scale utility um, level projects. So these aren't gonna be like the, small, the solar panels that you put on your roof. These are gonna be bigger projects. And I think the primary way that these are really interesting and why they might have these impacts on the planning process is precisely because they tend to be located in areas that have not had this sort of major industrial development happening. These are usually in remote areas, often quite scenic areas that don't normally have this sort of industrial development. So that's precisely um, the sort of context that I'm gonna be looking at here. So this is a map of the planning database that I'm gonna be working with. Um, it says the UK, I, I know that Northern Ireland isn't on here. That's not a political statement about Northern Ireland. That's primarily just the data with lacking in for those. So I'm just gonna focus on GB throughout. But what you can see here is on the left, you have the solar projects and on the right, the wind projects. There's about 3,500 in all. Um, and you can sort of see what you would expect. The solar projects tend to be in the south of the country. The wind projects are sort of further north on the coast as well, and also tend to be larger. Um, but one other thing that you can hopefully take away from this is in green are the ones that were approved planning permission and in red are the ones that refused planning permission. And hopefully you can already see that there's, a, there's more red on the right hand side for the wind projects, sort of giving you a sense that maybe the planning process is harder for those. This just shows you the same thing over time and you can see that wind projects have been being built since the sort of 90s, um, but really ramped up in the last decade or two. Um, solar projects, less of them, smaller amount of capacity, and they've only really showed up since around 2010. So the main thing that I want you to take away um, from this planning process and this table in particular is this just gives you an idea of the projects that I'm looking at and that are in the planning database going back over sort of three decades. You can see there's a roughly even split between wind and solar projects, but the wind ones tend to be much larger. But the key thing I want you to take away here is that the planning process is much tougher for wind projects. It takes sort of three times longer to get a decision. And when you do get that decision, that decision is no. About 39% of wind projects get approved, um, whereas 72% of solar projects get approved. There is a, an appeal process. Um, these are mostly decided at the local level by local authorities. Um, but there is an appeal process where the project developer can try to appeal the decision and then the national planning inspectorate can get involved and review it and decide whether to uphold that or overturn it. But even after accounting for that, it's still sort of 79, you know, almost 80% of solar projects are getting approved, but still less than half of wind projects get approved, which really suggests that they have a tough time. So the final bit of context I'll give is why, what, what possible reasons could be cited here. And so in, in this case, just to get at least an initial perspective on this, um, I got a bunch of undergraduates to actually go and download the planning documents and the decision documents for about 120 of these projects, 120 refusals, and then just pull out some of the key reasons that get cited. And overwhelmingly, the main thing that gets mentioned, at least stated as the reason why it's been refused, are kind of visual reasons, the adverse impact on the local landscape, overwhelmingly. Um, even the second concern of these kind of heritage impacts, sort of adverse impacts on cultural sites or castles or something like that, you could again think of as being a kind of visual impact as well. So those are primar the primary reasons that get cited and, and that's hopefully gonna come through in the next part when I look at what the actual local impacts are. Okay, 
So let's deal with this first question. What are these local impacts of, of these renewable energy projects? So the general approach here is going to be hopefully something that's pretty familiar. It's going to be a sort of difference in differences approach. So this is Lancaster. Um, this is actually where I grew up. This is where my family lives. My American sounding accent is from five years of living there, but I am actually from the UK originally. Um, and so this is Lancaster. This is where my family are. Um, and what I'm going to do in this analysis, this just gives you an idea, is first collect a bunch of data on commercial property rents. Um, so that's at these kind of census tract style um, areas. It's going to give you the sort of average value for those areas. And then I'm going to collect the kind of universe of property transactions, residential property transactions going back to 1995. And those that those are going to be available at these at the post at postcode level, which you can see here. And then I'm going to add in this planning database of all the projects. So in green, you can see the wind projects and in orange, you can see some solar projects. And then essentially what I'm going to do is draw some distant circles around this and do a sort of difference in difference analysis around these projects, looking at property values, how do they change before and after a project gets built. That's the sort of broad conceptual idea of what's going to be happening here. To put that more formally, you could think of treatment as being the combination of your distance to a project, a set of distance bins, a post indicator for whether or not the project has actually been built yet, and then some measure of the size of the project, um, where you would think a larger project is going to have bigger impacts than smaller ones. So here I'm just going to use the capacity of the project in megawatts. And in particular, I'm there's sort of a tried different functional forms around this capacity and consistent with the prior study, a sort of log functional form seems to make the most sense, where sort of the first wind turbine has a big incremental impact. But by the time you're at the ninth or the 10th wind turbine that's been added, the impact isn't as large. You've kind of already spoiled the area to some extent or changed the nature of the area. And so you have this attenuation effect. So I'm going to be able to capture that in this analysis. But more formally, this is the difference in different setup that I'm going to use, which is going to tell me the percentage change in property values as a result of placing a project two kilometers or four kilometers from my house. And I'm going to include sort of rich set of fixed effects and controls and also a range of different versions of this to really try and pull out something that seems like a credible causal estimate and gives you some insight into what these impacts are on property values. So this slide is my kind of kitchen sink. I've tried many different versions of this and to really sort of build some credibility into the analysis and give you a sense of what's going on. Everything from sort of limiting the sample to only really focusing on areas where these projects would plausibly be proposed, um, flexible controls and fixed effects to really isolate the variation that I'm interested in. And then I think some of the key value added is gonna be the actual sort of methods and specifications that I'm using. So throughout, I'm gonna be using these event studies as my preferred approach to show you how this effect materializes over time. And then add some extra things around sort of actually looking at what happens in areas where projects don't go ahead as a sort of comparison group. And then finally, a number of margins of heterogeneity that I'm going to look at. One including kind of direct line of sight visibility using a sort of GIS analysis to see if you can actually see the project from your house. And then secondly, this kind of do you live in a deprived area or not, which is going to turn out to be a really important one for pulling out which properties are most likely to be affected. Okay, so that's the kind of methods I'm going to use. Feel free to jump in if you have questions or we'll have plenty of time at the end, hopefully as well. Um, otherwise, I'll just move straight on to the results. Um, sorry, Stephen. Yeah, I do have a question. Hi, Michael. Uh, can you quickly talk about selection into treatment? Yes, so this is definitely a concern in this setting. The which projects get built, where they're located, it's not randomly assigned. And so this is gonna be a challenge in this area. And so what I'm gonna do is hopefully try, I take a number of steps to try and pin this down. Um, one is it's just gonna be interesting to see what happens in the areas where they get built versus the ones that they don't. The event study is gonna help with actually showing these kind of parallel trends between those two areas beforehand. And then there are some a number of other things that I tried to do to, to deal with that concern. Um, for example, looking at whether you find similar effects if you 
constrain the analysis just to the sort of set of projects that were sent to appeal as potentially giving you this more comparable, less prone to selection set of projects. But it's definitely a challenge with this um, particular kind of analysis and one that prior studies have had to run up against as well. Um, so I've tried to just up, up employ a range of different ways of, de of dealing with that strategy. Um, I think inevitably this is all going to be limited by the actual set of projects that ever get proposed. And so there might be a sort of external validity issue for this is only really going to tell you the impacts for those rather than ones that are outside that sample. So that's a sort of long winded of set way of saying it's not perfect, but hopefully the, the different steps I've taken will, will help um, sort of convince you that, that I've tackled that issue. Right. Just Thanks. developing on that point, is there anything about the uh, change in law around offshore and onshore planning? So they, I, th I believe onshore wind turbines effectively got stopped. Um, so does that affect kind of, you can't have onshore um, price data for the more recent, most recent years? Does that have any, because they just aren't being, they're not allowed to be proposed, is my understanding, but yeah, the, the, yeah. So a lot of roadblocks have been thrown up in the last sort of five years to onshore wind. Um, and actually, the, in the second part, I'm going to really get into this sort of trade off between onshore and offshore and offshore being a kind of interesting case where at least one of the reasons we're probably doing those things is because they're less likely to annoy people because they're a long way out to sea. Um, so I, I do, I'm going to get into that sort of trade-off, um, particularly in the second part, but it doesn't come through as much in this analysis of local impacts. Um, I don't make a sort of explicit decision to distinguish between the two. Um, the only real, you know, the only real way that it, that might be driven is just how close these projects are to where people live. And an offshore wind project that's 30 miles out at sea is probably not going to show up in any of the property value effects. Although um, the recent issues, including a court case yesterday, the offshore uh, NIMBY effects are often associated with where the power lands onshore. The actual, like the transmission infrastructure? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's one of the reasons why there's now uh, effort going in to making offshore networks more sophisticated so that they are sim not simply point to point ones, which give multiple onshore connection points. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I, that, that's not something I've looked at here. I've only really looked at the sort of placement of the turbines, but I've, I've seen in the US, for example, a similar, like this sort of issue get raised. Yeah, I, I, looking at the transmission infrastructure itself could be really interesting. I, I mean, it's interesting in a Norfolk context because the uh, High Court yesterday to, um, turned down uh, a Secretary of State consent for an offshore wind farm related to the onshore connection point. I'm now going to go and look that up. Thank you. You beat me to it, Tim. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, it's more <laughs> to do. It's more to do. The big contention there is the cabling and where the cabling ends up coming in and. Yes. how that works um, yes. as opposed to the turbine itself so yeah yeah and one of the underlying issues which you may come back to is you know given that the relative cost of offshore wind has fallen over the last period um, how much the relative NIMBY issues which are more onshore actually go to eliminate the effective cost differential between offshore and onshore yeah and so that that's You've perfectly encapsulated where I where I sort of end up with at least part of this paper is if 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 those learning benefits are real and have been really large, you could have this sort of counterintuitive situation where NIMBYism against onshore wind has pushed development offshore and that's created some real learning benefits that over time have, might actually be quite beneficial. And if that learning hasn't really materialized, then actually just the shift offshore has just been very expensive. So no, I think it, the, the evidence for learning and scale effects in plays into it. Yeah, I mean, the, the evidence for learning effects and in particular scale effects for offshore, because you can build much bigger turbines offshore, is that it's had a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's go through some of these results and then it sounds like we're going to have a ton to talk about at the end, which is great. Um, so. This is just showing you these event study results that I'm, that I'm, I'm gonna run through. Um, I'm gonna, this is for residential property values for wind projects, which is essentially where all the action is. So I'm gonna start with this one. And what you can see here is there's kind of five panels, um, each representing a different distance bin. So the top one is the kind of naught to two kilometer, the closest distance bin. Um, on the y-axis is the percentage change in property values. 
And this is going to be all for kind of a normalized for like a 10 megawatt project, the kind of median onshore wind project. Um, and then on the x axis is years relative to construction. And you can see that black vertical line, which is at zero when the project is actually built. Um, so what you can see is as you go closer, sort of starting at the bottom, the furthest distance bins, and, and as you move closer, you can see that it's pretty flat. Pre-trends are very, very flat. And you can just see there's not much action at these further distance bins. And it's only once you get into the sort of four kilometer or even the two kilometer range where you really see this, this effect start to materialize. And essentially what you've got here is in the solid line is what happens in areas near where a project is built. And you can see that that decreases um, even just before the project is actually built, which might be a response to when the planning decision is made. And actually the reverse seems to happen for these areas where they don't get built. Um, and initially I was like, is this just the sort of selection problem going on here? But I think the sort of general nature of the pre-trends are pretty tightly, these two areas are following a pretty similar trend beforehand. And you see this divergence happen when the project is actually gonna get built. And so what might be going on here is actually a really interesting example of kind of sorting behavior and this kind of growing premium on these unspoiled areas where projects which have successfully resisted development. But you can still see this reduction in property values near these areas where they are actually built. Just to give you a bit more of a sense of, of other ways of thinking about this. So that was using one whole regression and a set of distance bins. Another way to do it would be multiple regressions with sort of growing sets of distance circles. And as you might expect, you find very similar things. The results look pretty similar, not much going on at further distances, but as you get to those close distances, you see this divergence effect. What I've also done, as I said before, is look at some heterogeneity. Where is this effect coming from? And it gets much noisier because you're having to break down the sample more, but essentially this second column is the one that's where all the action is gonna be. So, the, so the first two are, can you see it? Is it directly visible from my house? And then this, this, the second and the fourth column are people who live in kind of less deprived, wealthier areas, the kind of properties that might be adversely affected by one of these. And what you see, even it's a bit noisy, but the key thing that you can really pick out when you look at this second column is that is where all of this divergence is coming from. All of, the vast majority of the effect is loaded into these areas which have direct line of sight, they're pretty close to where a, pro where a project gets built, and they're in these kind of wealthier, less deprived areas. Okay, so that's the residential property value impacts for wind projects, looking at things on the order of about 5% reduction in property values for a 10 megawatt project, if it's about two kilometers away. Um, so, all the action really is for these residential property values and for wind projects. What I've got the same things for solar projects and essentially what you find is not a lot going on. Um, and I think for me, this makes sense. Um, solar projects are sort of much lower to the ground. It's less visually intrusive. Often you can hide a lot of it behind a hedge depending on how hilly the area is. And so they've just tended not to have as bigger impacts. It gets a bit noisier when you get a bit closer here, but these this is even at much smaller distances. I've halved all the distances. And so we're even looking at sort of one to two kilometers away. You don't seem to see much of an effect. I did also look at commercial property values. Maybe there's some kind of impact on tourism, on sort of hotel values and things like that. And I think the key constraint here is, here is the data is just too noisy. It's these kind of averages of many different type, kinds of commercial uses. And so this is something where I really want to essentially go back and try and get sort of property level data on commercial values, commercial rents, also things like agricultural land values as well. So I couldn't find much of an impact here. Um, and the same is true for the solar projects. And so I'm not going to continue with this. I'm going to just focus on the residential stuff going onwards. But this might be an area for some future work. OK, so just to summarize that, Based on this analysis, it seems like there are some significant negative effects um, created by wind projects as measured by changes in residential property values. That's not an exhaustive measure of all the local impacts, but it should at least give us some significant monetary way of quantifying what these impacts are. Um, as you might expect, I find that they're larger when you're closer to a project. 
They're larger when you have direct line of sight and they're larger in these kind of wealthier, less deprived areas. As I just said, I just the data isn't really good enough to look at commercial stuff. So I can't really pick out much of an effect there. Um, and I don't seem to find much of an effect for solar projects. And that is more tightly estimated. Okay, so what I'm now gonna do is take that information through uh, to this later on analysis of the planning process itself. Um, and this has been a sort of really interesting piece of analysis. It's been a lot of fun to do, but also one that spurs a lot of comments. So I'm looking forward to getting a chance to talk about it a little bit as well. The general approach here, I've, I've sort of broken this down into three subparts, um, but I think there's a number of different ways that you could take it. Um, so for the first part, just the, this, the thing that I want to do here is almost just evaluation exercise. How large are these local impacts? Are they big or are they small relative to all the other costs and benefits that are re the reason why we're doing these projects in the first place? So essentially what I'm going to do is take those treatment effects from the first part, apply them to actually all the, val the value of all the properties that are located near each project to come up with a measure of the local impacts. And then at the project level, also calculate all the other costs and benefits that are the reasons we're doing one of these things. This would be the capital cost of building the project, the operating costs, the amount of electricity produced, the value of that electricity, and the value of any emissions that might be abated. So all of those factors I'm going to calculate at the project level and then compare them to these local factors. The second part is then going to take that information and then just do a very simple sort of not fancy um, regression analysis, just to see which are the decisions more sensitive to. Is it local factors or non-local factors? And so for this, it's just gonna be a very simple regression. This time an observation is a project. So there's about 3,500 projects, about 1,800 wind projects that I'm gonna focus on. And so the dependent variable is just a binary, was this approved or not? And then on the right hand side, I'm going to have the sort of all the factors that contribute to the change in local net present value, primarily the property value impacts, and all the sort of non location specific non local factors um, that all that contribute to the net present value. Can I project. just interject a moment and yes. ask you something? And that relates to your timeline, because as we know, after the Planning Act of 2008, we've got a National Infrastructure Commission. Yes. That takes away quite a significant amount of local discretion and decision making. Mm -hmm. And so would you expect to see an absence of correlation between what is happening on the ground and what is happening nationally? Because obviously planning is not an exact science. No. It covers much more than just monetizing property values. So, so how do you account for that? Yeah, and I think that's spot on. And so when you look at a lot of the other literature in this space, particularly the stuff on sort of local acceptance, it's a more sociological literature and it's looking at how do you build community buy-in? This is a political process and we've got to think about relative power of different actors. And I think have that perspective is critical to really thinking about these sort of planning processes and sort of local versus national dynamics. And so what I'm doing here is a much more kind of anodyne let's do the numbers and see what, what, how things respond to the numbers. But the process is more complicated than that. And so hopefully I think this just provides an alternative perspective. And then you've got to weigh that against the sort of political realities of how this would work. But I think the main goal here is to not get into too much of the, that nitty, grit, nitty gritty detail and just think if we were just to think of this as just a narrow sort of cost benefit trading off pounds here and pounds there exercise, how would, how would that sort of deem the planning process to be working? And then, and then you can get to the sort of policy side of things of, is that realistic? So that's sort of how I've tried to think about this because it's not really a way that um, I've seen the planning process evaluated in this context. But uh, to your other point about the, the planning process changing over time, it's a good one. And it's not one that I've built in too much into this analysis. Um, I think I've it's tried an to important show one to how consider. these effects might vary for sort of, yeah. are you in a I conservative really area simple. or is it a national agency that's in, in charge? But, but I haven't really done too, dug too much into how it's changed over time. So I, I think that's something that's worth, worth doing a bit more of. 
Did you have a follow up? I couldn't, I couldn't hear. I thought someone might be trying to talk. Um, no, all I was going to say was that is a significant issue. And the other factor is this. It's historically, I think a few people have actually looked at planning in terms of cost benefit and mm -hmm. monetization. But the confounding issue is that when you go through that exercise, it doesn't necessarily inform the ultimate outcome. So that's something perhaps to be aware of. Yeah, and and I think that makes a ton of sense that those there are other reasons that are driving the, these decisions. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. And and hopefully this kind of approach still has some value as like well, let's let's start from this point and then think about. How, how things might deviate from that. But yeah, I, th I think you're spot on. Okay, so that's the broad setup here is just a very simple regression looking at what are these decisions most sensitive to it? Is it these local factors, at least as measured by changes in property values or these non-local factors? Um, and I think for some benevolent social planner that's not in any way realistic, um, you might think that these betas should be positive, they're sort of responding to positive improvements in net present value, and maybe even the same for some sort of national planning agency, they should sort of care about local factors, but also national non-local factors. But if you think that the local factors are what's really driving the process, then maybe these, this coefficient is larger. So that's part two, and then the final part is just pulling this through into an analysis of kind of misallocated investment. And I think this speaks to the point that you were just making about the nature of the political process and sort of this local versus national dynamic. Essentially, what I'm going to show here is in the first part, I've essentially done a net present value, a full valuation of all these different projects. And so there's sort of 3,500 projects in total, 1,800 win projects, less, you know, some portion of them were actually built, but you could imagine reallocating from those projects to some of these other ones that weren't built, maybe they would have been more beneficial to society, at least through this valuation. What are the potential gains? How much money have we left on the table if we could reallocate to some of these other projects? And hopefully what I want that sort of analysis to show is, is that a potentially big gap and what might be driving that gap and how can we link that to the, some of the dynamics within the planning process? Okay, so I've got sort of 20 minutes or so, which is great. So I'm gonna just run through these and then hopefully we can have a sort of nice discussion about some of these findings. Um, so the first part is how big are these local effects, at least as measured by local property values. And so here, what I'm gonna show you is, this is the annual average costs and benefits of solar projects on the left and wind projects on the right. This is all normalized by the number of, by sort of per unit energy produced. And the key thing that I want you to show here is just sort of the relative size of some of these different costs and benefits. And what you can see, for example, with the solar projects on the left is this sort of rapid decline in costs. Capital costs have come up, come down a lot. There's been a lot of te technological progress in this area. Um, and then some of the key benefits are things like the value of the electricity produced. And I have even tried to add in something that captures some of these learning by doing these sort of technological benefits that were, that were flagged earlier on. It's not perfect, but it doesn't really matter too much for the trade-off between these two different technologies. It's just to give some sense of the size of what those might be. On the right-hand side though, are these wind projects. And these are the ones where you actually see these local impacts. So again, you can see there's been somewhat of a declining trend in, in the capital costs of these projects. Although the increasing amount of offshore projects has sort of slowed that down a little bit. Um, and then interestingly on the benefit side, again, the value of the electricity produced, but, in, but you can also see something that's I think quite important to note is that the environmental benefits of these projects have been changing over time. So if you build a wind project in 1990, the electricity it produces over its lifetime is gonna be displacing quite a lot of coal generation, other sort of fossil fuel generation. And so actually has some quite large environmental benefits. Whereas a project built today, the grid is already pretty clean. There's not much coal running. And so the actual environmental benefits over its lifetime are much lower. The final piece of the puzzle that I'm essentially adding in here are these local impacts on property values to give some sense of how large they are. And here you can kind of see them in orange. They're pretty small. They kind of vary depending on the projects that are being built. 
Um, but what this actually masks here, these are just kind of annual averages. What this masks is there's a lot of heterogeneity across different projects. So if I show you the full ranking of all the projects here from sort of most expensive to least expensive, you can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity with some projects that have no real local impacts. They're sort of a long way from where people live, don't seem to be adversely affecting many sort of valuable properties or anything like that. And whereas some have really large impacts. I think if I can like zoom in, you can see, yeah, there are some with really large impacts and some with pretty small ones. And this heterogeneity is what's gonna potentially drive some of the decision-making that I'm gonna look at in the planning process. Okay, so that gives some useful sense of the scale of these things. Um, what I then, the second part of the analysis was just a very simple regression to try and figure out what is the planning process more sensitive to. So what I, I'll take you through this table step by step. Um, first, let's just focus on columns one and columns four and ignore some of the heterogeneous effects stuff. So each of these coefficients is telling you if there's a sort of improvement in the net present value of a project, do you see an improvement in the likelihood of it being approved? So this coefficient here is telling you if there's 10 million pounds of extra benefits for the local community, this will actually be in the, in the form of sort of less property value losses. But if there's a 10 million pound improvement, you see a 0.1 percentage point increase in the likelihood of a project being improved. But that's really small and it's not statistically significant. Um, interestingly, this coefficient here on the kind of non-local stuff is also really small, it's actually negative as well, which suggests that some of the more beneficial projects are actually less likely to be approved. And I think this is a kind of a size bias. Local planning officials don't like large projects, but in general, both of these coefficients are very small. There's just not much sensitivity to the planning process to just variations in the costs and benefits of these projects. The key thing with this first column though, and this is all looking at wind projects, there's about 1800 of them, this first column doesn't include any county fixed effects. So this is just allowing for all the variation in all the projects across the country. There's a year fixed effect in there, but essentially not controlling for sort of county level differences. But I think this ignores a key way that the planning process actually works. Most of these decisions are made at the local level and a given county, Dorset County or whatever, they're not really paying attention to the projects elsewhere. They're just Can thinking I just about interject the five here projects that they have to approve. That have that's been where there's a problem. There. Pardon? Can I just interject here? Because that's where it becomes problematic. Yes. These are not local decisions. Well, I think so. The vast majority of them are decided by the local planning authorities. No, they're not. After 2008, they're not. That's the whole point. So in the, plan, in the planning database, any project that is below 50 megawatts, definitely the primary decision maker is the local planning agency. There is national planning guidance that they have to follow and they can have their decision appealed to the national agency, but the actual decision about whether to approve or not is made by the local authority. That's- but You see, this is the problem because where you say it's made by a local decision maker, but the confines in terms of actually deciding are really quite constrained because planning authorities must be guided by central policy and decision making and the central structure. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, one of two things can happen. There can either be an appeal yeah. or else the Secretary of State could just call this in and say, no, you don't. So, so that is something to be very, very aware of. Yeah, and I think, I, I think that's right. There is scope for that to happen in the process. And so out of the wind projects, I think there's 1800 here, 300 of them end up getting appealed. And I think there, there are very few, maybe five, 10, um, that where you see that there was a secretary of state decision. Of course, there's always the threat of that happening, but it, at least procedurally, it seems like the planning process is driven by the local, the local decision makers, even if they have to um, abide by some of these national factors. I, I get the point you're making, but it, it does seem like there is a real large role for local, deci local decision making. And that's even increased more recently with some of the changes that were made to the planning system in kind of 2015. So 
Local, I agree. Then they're, they're operating in this national context. They have to care what the Secretary of State is going to say, uh, and maybe that leads to changes systematically in how decisions get made over time. But I think there is still a really big role for these local decision makers in terms of being the first port of call for just, uh, for listening to. There's also something else to be aware of. Please recall that when you're talking about the planning system, you've got England and Wales, and you've got Scotland. Yeah. Yes, and I think the threshold for the Scottish government getting involved seems to be lower, or at least they get involved in more of these projects, was my read from the data. Okay, so this was just looking at all the kind of variation across all the different projects. But if you then add in like a local authority fixed effect, if you control for sort of variation across different local authorities, some have high local impacts on average, some have low local impacts on average, some are just sort of systematically different in how they view these applications. Once you control for that and you're looking at variation within Dorset County, Dorset County has five different projects approved. How is it weighing off the different ones that have been approved? Suddenly you see that this sensitivity to local impacts really shows up. So now it's sort of much, much larger and a significant coefficient. This is telling you that a 10, if they can avoid 10 million pounds in property value impacts, there are 3% more likely to approve this project, or the project is 3% more likely to be approved, which I think makes sense with sort of the broad structure of how a local authority would think about the, the projects that it's deciding on and which ones to approve and which ones to not. Um, and it's just interesting that it is in fact these local factors that they're particularly sensitive to in terms of the magnitude of this coefficient, um, whereas there isn't much change in the way that they're thinking about these other factors. I did also try and look at some heterogeneity here. Um, the sample size isn't very large, so the, the, the sort of significance of this is pretty limited, but at least directionally, these coefficients seem to make sense. So if you look at um, for sort of conservative areas where it's sort of dominated by conservative councillors at the local level, you, you can see that they are um, the sort of positive coefficient, they're more likely to be sensitive to these local factors um, than, than less conservative areas. And then similarly, when you look at whether the, the final decision was made at the national level, so to, to the earlier point that was raised, some of these can be reviewed and the final decision is made at the national level, either because it's a large project or because it went to appeal. Um, and here you can see that, again, this local um, sensitivity to local impacts is primarily for, for when it's not decided at the national level. And you see a slight sort of reduction in this sensitivity once it gets brought up to a national decision. This is all more directional, but I think at least directionally, these coefficients make sense with how the planning process probably plays out. Okay, so the final piece of the puzzle here. So I think what that, it's all kind of indicative, but I think what it points to is when you look at all the projects being approved across the country, the planning process doesn't seem to be particularly systematically responsive to some of these costs and benefits that I'm looking at here. But when you zone in on each county and look at the range of projects that they're having to approve, this sensitivity potentially shows up. And I think this could point to two problems. One is a sort of NIMBYism bias. When you think of the projects that Dorset County is having to approve, it's got this systematic sensitivity to these local factors. But then also there's a potential coordination problem here where there could be real gains from reallocating projects across counties. And the planning process just isn't really very sensitive to that at least when it's being decided at the local level. What that could point to is some real risk for misallocated investment or potentially just some gains to be had from reallocating where projects get, get, get built or even doing that within counties. So to try and get some sense of the scale of that, um, I had a go at doing this misallocated investment analysis to look at in, if there was some benevolent social planner that really believed all the costs and benefit numbers that I've calculated, how might they reallocate the projects that get built and what sort of potential gains that might, might that produce? So this is just to give you some sense of that. Um, so wind is the first three columns, solar projects is the next two columns. Um, you can see for this first row, there's about 700 wind projects that got built, a thousand solar projects that got, that got built and the wind projects are sort of 1200 terawatt hours of production over their lifetime, solar projects much smaller, about 128 terawatt hours over their lifetime. 
So that's what got built. Those are the projects that actually happened. You could imagine, let's just think about what would have happened if instead we built all the projects that my valuation analysis says has a have a positive net present value. What might that have done to the set of projects that got built? And that's what you can see in these column ones. So for the wind projects, you see there's a big in, in, increase in the number of projects that get built. Another sort of 300 primarily onshore wind projects go ahead. And this leads to a sort of increase in the amount of renewable energy produced um, and some potential gains as well. So the, net, the total net present value of all the projects that actually got built it's pretty small, it's sort of 1.7 billion, although there's a lot of variability around that depending on things like discount rates and stuff like that. But just using these central values, if you reallocated to these other projects that have positive net present value, you would add a bunch of projects, you would remove some of the costly ones that got built and realize some kind of 30 billion or so in potential gains. A big chunk of those gains could actually, you can tie them to changing a planning decision, sort of denying a project that was approved and approving a project that was refused. You can realize quite a lot of those gains from actually just flipping the decisions that were made in the planning process, which I think does point to potentially the planning process having a role to play in this, the sort of misallocation that I, or in this case, underinvestment that I'm talking about here. For solar projects, there's less going on, um, there's just less of them and less of this misallocation seems to be happening. You can, you know, you can you do see an increase in the amount of um, output from these projects when you reallocate, but actually it's done with less projects as a move towards kind of larger projects. But the actual gains on the table are pretty small. It doesn't seem like there's a huge kind of reallocation benefit here. Column two is another way of thinking about the same analysis. So instead of just approving all kind of net present value project, positive projects, let's imagine a world in which you, you constrain things. To, we want to have the same rollout of renewable energy that we've observed already, but let's just reallocate to projects that other projects that can, that can create that at least cost. So here you can see that rather than increasing the total amount of electricity produced is now fixed at about 1200 and about 128 here. Um, so, but how can we get to that total at least cost? How can we reorganize some of the projects we, we approve each year to get there at uh, lower cost? And again, you can see that much of the same kind of scale of benefit is slightly smaller, but there's still a similar amount of gains left on the table here. Again, a lot of it can potentially be pinned on planning decisions that were made. The final one that I've got here is just a slight tweak on that that gets to one of the earlier points that was raised about this onshore offshore trade off. A lot of these gains that are happening in these first two columns for wind projects are about reallocating away from offshore wind to onshore wind because some of the early offshore wind projects that we built, they were really expensive. But I think there's a real uncertainty about the amount of learning that those have created and there could be some real dynamic benefits from having incurred those large costs up front. So if you just constrain things to just no substitution is allowed if allowed from onshore to offshore and vice versa, you get this third column here where, as you might expect, the potential gains are reduced significantly, but they're still pretty substantial on the order of sort of seven to eight billion pounds. You could potentially re realize from just sort of reallocating amongst the projects that were built. And so I think this is sort of where I wanted to go with this analysis is to use the, this, this sort of approach to give some sense of the potential scale of re reallocation that might happen if you did this kind of valuation exercise and if you took the perspective of some sort of benevolent national social planner, just to give some sense of, is this a large problem or a small problem? And it seems at least for wind projects, there could be some real gains being left on the table here. So what I wanna conclude with, I'll just summarize that. And then I think what that sort of conclusion really has brought me to is thinking about policy solutions in this area. But just to summarize, um, this first part of the analysis, looking at the local impacts, I find that wind projects have significant negative effects, at least as measured by residential property values. This is larger when houses are closer, when the project is more visible, and when they're in less deprived wealthier areas. I don't seem to find much of a significant effect for solar projects. When you bring that through into the, an evaluation of the planning process, it does seem like some of these local impacts of wind projects can actually be quite large, but there is a real heterogeneity across different projects. And when that gets factored through into the planning process, it does seem like potentially 
at least when you look at the decisions that a county is making uh, over the range of projects that it has oversight of, they are quite sensitive to these local factors, which makes a lot of sense. Potentially, this could though be leading to some real misallocation in the projects that actually go ahead and can actually make it through the planning process. And for wind projects, this could be quite large. Some of it is driven by a sort of systematic bias against projects that impose large local costs. And some of it is just driven by a lack of coordination. A lot of these decisions being made by individual counties and them not being able to reallocate across counties in the same way. That's potentially points to some larger problem with the planning process, but I do wanna bring it back to and finish with kind of the policy side of things and the political side of things. Because I think this is one way of looking at how the planning process has played out for these projects. But clearly it's a lot more complicated than that. And there's a good reason why a lot of these decisions are made at the local level. And it is a primarily a political process as well. And so when you can think about making changes in this space. I think that's a really big thing to, to focus on and maybe where I want to conclude. And what I'm hoping to take with this next is to move on to looking at some of the policy solutions that have been tried in this area. Everything from sort of stricter national standards to um, kind of beefing up the potential compensation that can be provided to residents through things like community development funds to even just outright local ownership. All of these things have been tried in different contexts and potentially are our solutions for this sort of problem. But what I'm hoping to look at is, have they worked and how can they be improved? So I think that's all my time. So I'm just gonna like end there. Um, but I would, thanks very much for, like, for having me and I, I'd love to take your comments and, and talk about this more. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. I'd, I'd just like to thank you. And you can imagine there are uh, many other people uh, giving you a hand right now, a virtual hand. Uh, it's it's uh, been very interesting to have your, your presentation. So the main pe presentation we're ending now uh, so that anyone who, who needs to leave should feel comfortable doing that. And then we're gonna have a tea uh, with Stephen afterwards. Um, and so uh, so if anyone needs to go off and, and get something, uh, please, please feel free to do so. I have one question I just wanted to throw in there. Uh, as a as, uh, concluding remark before I'm going to go off and get something uh, and then come back. But uh, have, you, have you looked at uh, this, this regulatory change that Tola was mentioning uh, that occurred around 2008 to see if there's a break in your data around 2008 and some, some different kinds of results and whether, you know, is it even possible for you to do an evaluation of that uh, policy change? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the short answer is no, I haven't looked at that, um, but I will definitely go and look at that now. I think 2008 would be an interesting one in terms of the planning regs, but also 2015, conservative government saying, you know, all of these onshore wind projects are going to have a slightly harder time, both in terms of the subsidies they get, but also all the decisions are getting going to be put first at the local level. So I think both of those could be interesting sort of break points to look at. I think one of the constraints has usually been just the number of observations. I mean, there's, you know, almost 2000 projects, but um, particularly earlier on, there's maybe less. So it, that might end up being a constraint on that sort of thing, but I think it's definitely worth looking at for sure. Okay, sounds good. I'll be back in just a minute. Okay, I will stick around. I, I have my coffee, so, but feel free to head off. I'll, I'll, I'll be around. One, one thing which um, might be, and I'm not sure how you've taken account of this already, but I think there may be a problem from not disaggregating offshore and onshore in the basic regressions for two reasons mainly, I think, although they're interrelated. One is the scale variable works very differently, I think, as between offshore and onshore. And the other is the distance variable works very differently for the reason that your distance variable, I think for the reason we were talking about earlier, relates to the wind farm, whereas the actual distance variable, which often makes the difference to the local amenity and therefore the resistance, is the onshore infrastructure necessary to connect up that offshore wind farm. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I, th I think in the, um, with the kind of distance to these wind farms thing, it actually ends up being the case that most of the offshore projects just drop out of the analysis because they're usually more than 10 kilometers offshore. There are some of them that are a bit closer to shore. You know, some, some, I think there's at least one up in Scotland that's like 
two kilometers offshore and it is actually pretty close to where people live and so from the perspective of the analysis i just treat that as being pretty similar to an onshore wind project um but yeah maybe more explicitly accounting for the difference between the two could could be worth doing um and, yeah, and, and i definitely I haven't other, accounted for this kind of transmission infrastructure piece that you're talking about yeah the other thing i think linked to it is that the trends in cost whether it be learning scale or whatever or just competitive tendering in some cases um have been huge so the earliest offshore wind farms were getting roughly about 15 pence a kilowatt hour um you know hugely more than onshore wind whereas more recent ones you're talking you know four or five pence a kilowatt hour you mm -hmm. know which is very competitive absent system effects with um other sources of both renewable and non-renewable energy. So I think that is sort of in the background there. Um, and so in terms of the sort of when you're looking at the NPV effects, yeah, certainly for offshore, and as you say, you've probably excluded a whole lot of the offshore stuff anyway on, on, on the basis of, of, of the, you know, of, of various things, filters you've used. But, you know, that's going on in the background. It, you know, it's a bit like, you know, it just hasn't been constant. Um, yeah. In terms of, yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, I, I think that's spot on. And, and so that's why, at least in that last table that I showed you, I tried to include this extra column where you just don't allow for this swapping of onshore for offshore. Because if you just think of this as like a static trade off the costs and benefits of each project in each year, then you do, in probably a quite myopic sense, just move from these expensive looking offshore ones and just move to more onshore ones. And I think that can be misleading if there has been a lot of these learning benefits. Um, and, and potentially some of the costliest projects that you're talking about, the very early offshore wind projects, look very, very costly in a static sense, but those are the, precisely the ones that created a lot of that initial learning. And if there has been a lot of that that's happened, those are really the ones that you definitely wanted to have built. Um, so that trade-off becomes really complicated by that um, the learning piece. And it <laughs> turns out it's really hard to put any sort of solid number on that. So I've tried to just do different versions of it that can, that can account for how important that is. And the other trend clearly is in terms of where offshore wind farms will be in relation to the coast. Mm -hmm. The early ones were basically point to point connections, fairly close to shore. Right. Um, all of the new big ones will be much further out and probably will eventually connect to, um, you know, as I say, relatively sophisticated offshore transmission networks. Yeah, I think that's right. And so they sort of increasingly factor into this kind of local impacts uh, analysis just less and less because they're just sort of further away from any kind of community that might be directly affected. But the transmission infrastructure piece is a good one. I haven't thought of that before. Just to say, there's a uh, in the chat. There's a question from Andrew on, again on this offshore onshore point. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and what's the impact of just sort of excluding ones that are too far offshore? That affects the estimates. Is his point? Um, I'm guessing this, at least with respect. I'm I'm assuming this is related to the first part. The kind of what are the local impacts piece. Um, I don't know if it should, I'm, I'm not sure. My guess would be they don't show up in the initial analysis when you're estimating those treatment effects because the furthest distance bin is kind of 10 kilometers and they're like 30 kilometers out to sea. So they're just not affecting any properties, um, at least in terms of this, the way that I've structured this analysis. So they wouldn't affect the treatment effect, but they also wouldn't show up in the second part because they never have that effect applied to them because they're so far away. So they just sort of get hidden from the analysis into at least in terms of their local impacts, but they do come through in, in the second piece when, because I do still do the whole net present value calculation for those projects. And you could imagine the fact that they produced no local impacts was probably one of the reasons why they were approved in the first place and should be a part of the story as to how, you know, should we trade off against them or not. Um, but I, I, I think in general, they just sort of drop out of at least the first part of the analysis. 
I was going to ask, kind of, presumably when you talk about doing the analysis with commercial property values, the, the hypothesis is there that there isn't an amenity value to view, so it's like a control. Is that the logic? Yeah, well, so I, th I think it depends on the, on the commercial property we're talking about. And what yeah. I'm hoping to do as the next piece is the, so this was all using sort of England and Wales property data. So like valuation office agency for the commercial stuff and then land registry for the residential stuff. But the national records of Scotland they, that you can get hold of property level transactions for residential, but also for commercial and agricultural land values. And so I'm hoping to get them to let me access that. And then, cause I think that it could be interesting to look at these other two pieces of the puzzle, the commercial uses and the, the agricultural land. Because um, I, I think there could be real effects there for yes. some commercial uses. The effect is probably zero for like industrial uses where they, you know, the view is completely orthogonal to a yeah. warehouse's value. Um, but for a hotel or some kind of tourism related use where, sure. where the sort of nature of the area really does matter, then I, you, you could imagine there being a negative effect that shows up there. So that's the sort, that's the sort and of does thing the I had data mind, allow you to do by pro type of commercial property so differentiate or you have to add in extra things like uh licenses for out serving alcohol and things like that <laughs> yeah I'm, I, I think i think you should be able to get it by type um so i don't know exactly what the national registers data looks like but at least for the valuation office where they do the kind of business rates valuation you can see the actual sort of sector of, of the property okay. and so there you know there are 50,000 yeah. hotels in there or something like that. That's the kind of thing I had in mind um, when looking for this sort of impact on non-residential stuff. And then the other one with farmland, kind of I thought there could be, <clears throat> it could be, I don't know what your plan was there, but it could be complicated because you presumably there, a farmland could be a site for another wind turbine. Exactly. If, and yeah. But it's how you think about, is it a substitution or a complementarity effect? Because in a sense, do you have, within a local area, do you go, oh, we built a wind turbine, we're not going to build any more wind turbines. And also the, the technological of the sort of like wind flow patterns, somehow you no longer have calm air, you now can't build within a given distance of it. Or do you have it that, well, we built one wind turbine in this broad area, this council is likely to allow other wind turbines, hence the property value goes up. I think you're absolutely spot on with that. And, and that's the kind of thing, I don't, I don't have a strong prior as to exactly which one of those dynamics would mm -hmm. dominate, but I think that would be the interesting thing to potentially try and tease out. There has been one other paper that looked at land values. They did it here in Germany and sort of showed that when you look at changes in the generosity of the subsidy regime, you can see that that result in changes in agricultural land values, particularly in the values of areas that could feasibly have wind projects built on them but there was less of an attempt to tie that to specific wind projects. So yeah, I think you could see some of these dynamics that you're talking about where some land appreciates in value because it could potentially be developed. Yeah. Other land could depreciate in value because a project has already been built on the neighboring plot and that sort of means that you can't do one nearby. It could happen in many different sort of directions like that, which I think it could be quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's just how you, actually get the data on that in, or, or how you measure it, I guess, is the challenge. Yeah. And I guess my short answer is I haven't really figured, I haven't no. figured out the mechanics <laughs> of how you would do that yet. I mean, you, in principle, the data is there. In principle, the information on properties is there and you could get the sort of, you could come up with some measure of suitability based on so how windy is the area yeah. or something like that. Um, but figuring out each of those kind of levers, um, it seems thorny, but yeah, I haven't got a strong sense no. of exactly how you tell. I guess also there might be an effect between arable and pastoral. Kind of, if you've got animals, perhaps farmers view that creates problems to noise, whereas with wheat, no one cares. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and sort of opportunity cost. Which which kind of um, uses can you do whilst also having the yeah. to the turbines, and which ones are not complementary? Yeah, there's. Because I think you can have sheep and solar panels. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Catherine, I think has a has a question or comment. Yeah. Um, thanks. It's it, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was re really thanks. interesting, and particularly in this part of part of the world. Um, 
I have a really stupid question, which I obviously wasn't paying attention to earlier on. So it's a clarification one of how you deal with the change in in value, residential value of projects that didn't go ahead. What was your, you talked about avoiding those harms and um, if, if, if the project didn't go ahead. And I just wasn't, could you just remind me of how those were calculated? Yeah, um, so the broad approach was exactly the same as the approach for the ones that did go ahead, um, but just using these projects that were proposed but didn't. So the same sort of, I constructed the same set of um, variables. Here we go, this part. So treatment is the same, it's sort of distance to a completed project, but in the other case, it would just be distance to a proposed project. And then the post indicator is for the completed project, when was it actually built? For the, um, for the proposed, the one that didn't go ahead, it's sort of, when would it have been built if it had, if it had have been approved? And I had to sort of impute that a little bit. Um, and the capacity is the same, it's sort of taken from the database. So the idea was to construct it in exactly the same way and see how, what sort of treatment effects that produces. But, but haven't you got a valuation, haven't you got a variable in there, which is the um, change in the residential value after the thing is, well, at, through time as it's planned and built? Yes. And so what, what happened, so you're just saying there isn't any? So you just don't observe that change if it was not built. Is that what you're saying? So I, so I observe the change, the setup okay. is the same. So it's using the same property value data. So again, for a project that was built, I'm gonna be looking at the properties that were located near that. But the, the idea would be to do exactly the same thing with a project that wasn't built. If it had have been built, which, which properties were near it, which ones would have been affected? The broad okay. kind of setup is the same in terms of the dependent variable that I'm using. I, th I, th I think. I think yeah, I'm okay, thank you. your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. And Just there are more questions yeah, in the chat, aren't there? More questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, the ones from Mike Rock. Um, so it's about, yeah, so it's, um, I can't remember what it's called, basically where you, you replace older wind turbines with bigger wind turbines. Oh, yeah, yes. So I can, I can come in if you want, David. Yeah, so my question was really just, I remember that there is, you know, it's, it's much easier to be able to do what is the equivalent of a brown site redevelopment. Right. And I wondered whether, particularly for some of your later projects, I'm looking at what was actually, what, what firms asked, or, or, or wind turbine companies are asking to try and put through the planning process, mm -hmm. whether they're a bit strategic and they think, well, actually now that we've already got this handful of sites, we're better to re just wait until those need recommissioning and then doing it with what are now much better turbines, yes. which is the way that the technology has gone. Um, yes. So that might skew your data. Now, I don't really think there's an answer to that, but I wondered if you'd kind of accounted for it um, and thought about that in terms of the kind of projects, if there's been a change in the kind of projects applied for or who's applying for them, maybe that might also give you an indication of that. Yeah, so I mean, a couple of points on that one. So your point about, um, I think it's called repowering, where they sort of take an old site and replace the turbines that are at the site. Um, and at least, so I'm looking sort of 1990 up to 2018. Um, and so there are some repowering, but there's, you know, it's like single digits, there aren't too many of those. And so I don't think it over affects the actual analysis that I've done so far, because most of the projects, well, almost all of the projects are brand new projects. But I think over the repairing is starting to happen as the projects age out and will be become a much bigger part of the, the set of things that get built in the next 10 years. So I think that could be a really interesting thing to look at, whether you see the same effect occurring when there's this kind of repairing thing that goes on, perhaps there's no effect. Um, and, and I think there probably would be none. Um, people almost, so I, I just, it hasn't happened enough for me to have looked at it explicitly, explicitly thus far, but, but I think it could be a really interesting direction to take this in the future. Um, and I think even more generally thinking about how these effects might change over time, do communities just kind of get used to this thing? And so it's sort of not seen as much of an eyesore, uh, stuff like that, again, is not something that I've dug into in too much detail, but could be a sort of nice direction to take this sort of study.
Yeah, it kind of li links a little bit towards David's point, right? So it's almost the same logic as, oh, well, if one council approved this one, they might well approve another one. Yeah. It's almost like, well, if this community are used to being surrounded by wind turbines, they, well, they won't mind a few more. Um, yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you. That's great. It's a really good talk. Really liked it. Thank you. Thank you. No, well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Should, uh, I'll just go through. Yeah, the final one is more is just a debate about sort of whether there's something interesting if you can look at different countries in England, well, England versus Wales versus Scotland. This is Andrew's comment. Uh, is there heterogeneity in the effects of nimbyism by country? Good question. The shorter answer is I have not looked at that. But I, but I will look at that. I will, I will see if it, if it varies by country, um, at least in terms of the um, sensitivity to these local factors. Um, yeah, I think that's worth looking at. And definitely Scotland is the one that I'm hoping to do a bit more analysis in with, with a follow on, both in ter terms of that national records of Scotland data that I was talking about for commercial uses and things like that. But also I've managed to get um, the, there's like a register in Scotland of all the developers sort of publicize and register their kind of community engagement and also how much money they've paid to the local community. And so I'm kind of hoping that um, that sort of data, database could be an interesting way to look at, do these sort of direct local compensation schemes, do they actually work in terms of getting people on board, making projects more likely to be approved and, are they in some way scaled to the to the size of local impact? So Scotland could be a particularly interesting one to focus on, but on, on this sort of, do you see a difference between the two? It, I haven't looked at it um, explicitly yet. All right, Stephen, I think we might be ending up here. Um, do you have anything else you wanted to, to, to say or pass on? Um, nothing major. I mean, thank you very much for having me. Um, and if, if you found this work interesting or if you have graduate students who find this work interesting, um, as I said, this is the kind of thing that I'm hoping to do some more, more work on in this space. Um, and at some point we'll would love to get some people on board you know with the scotland project or something like that so um yeah i glad you glad you found the work interesting and um feel free to reach out if you have further comments or if you want to put me in touch with someone who's interested in this kind of work okay very i mean it's very interesting indeed and it, uh, boy we'd love to have you over to visit if that were uh you know uh, uh, possible uh, and so maybe in the future we'll be in the, and we could get you to to come over for for a week if you like uh, at some point uh, yeah that would be if, fantastic if that I mean, were interesting sometime later this year if the world vaguely return, returns to normal i'm sure my family would love me to come over so uh yeah okay. if, if we can make that work that sounds fantastic okay super all right well um unless there is anybody else uh we've got a, a clapping hand from catherine so thank you again Stephen. thank you uh thank you from all of us are we're doing our virtual clapping um, <laughs> and uh that's it's really been uh, very interesting to learn about uh about this research and uh, we hope that uh, you still drink tea after all these years in the u.s <laughs>